everyone for having me here. I think it's so incredible that even in small cities, uh, people come together in large groups to talk about their city, and it's so necessary to to do that. And I'm going to be talking today a bit about our work in uh, New York. I'm going to be touching a bit on my Dutch background, and so maybe sort of speculate about it, what brought me as a Dutch architect and urbanist to New York and to deal specifically with resiliency uh, projects. Um, I'm going to take a uh, sort of small sidestep to show some work in Boston and maybe also think a bit about uh, uh, Portsmouth uh, here. But before I do all that, I would like to start with a, a video which sort of uh, shows the uh, project in New York that has kept me, or is keeping me busy, uh, but has kept me busy for the last four years. That was actually why Sandy was so bad, is uh, because of the phase of the moon, it was already a very large high tide, as well as the storm surge coming in with the, the wind and the tide lining up perfectly to give us 14 foot tides <laughs> instead of eight foot. The most shocking part of uh, Hurricane Sandy was the fact that it, it, uh, it exceeded expectations. I think the sheer magnitude of it caught a lot of people off guard. When Hurricane Sandy came, we were not prepared at all. I mean, not even the slightest. Yeah, it was like an alien invasion of water. And not the good kind of water. So yeah, I mean, it came right in front where the, there was literally boats on 14th Street floating in front of our, in front of our window. We had a sub-basement level office a block from here. And it was totally covered in water for two days. So we lost everything, everything. We're really concerned about another storm and the flooding that's possible. And we think that the next time, it's going to come even further inland. I'd like to see some type of flood protection in this area. Um, that's going to happen. Um, we're vulnerable, obviously, being as close to the water. Something that just brings like uh, more walks, different walks of life, you know, uh, another escape from just the busyness and the hustle and bustle. Um, there's this great space that could really become community space, cultural space, and, and, and active uses. Everyone enjoys space. And uh, in New York and other congested cities, it's hard to come by. Anything that makes the cities greener is just such a wonderful thing for not only the environment, but the people that live in the city, too, to be able to be around that space. Uh, the plans, the berming, the sense of how it can become into the natural landscape itself, uh, how we want to program that is, uh, is, is, is really the next challenge. We are the link, we're the tip in the sense of the big U. It's important that the entire waterfront of Lower Manhattan uh, build in the plans that have been put forward because we can not only fortify this great city of New York, but be a model for cities all over the world. made this film um, about four years, three or four years ago when we won a competition uh, to flood protect uh, New York. And I think the reason I entered that competition was that as someone from the Netherlands, I, I sort of felt that I could bluff my way into one. <laughs> um, 
because we've been dealing with water for so long. And it's really very much embedded in our in our culture. Uh, uh, we we live in a in a country uh, where you see here the uh, blue areas are below sea level, and that means that not only is about thirty percent of our country below sea level, but also much of it uh, is very flat and and prone to flooding. So with a good storm. Like, like, well, we don't have hurricanes like uh, 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 of the magnitude of Sandy. Uh, so about 70% of the country would be underwater. And, and the way people started to, the Dutch started to deal with that was, of course, first build these mounds on, on which they would sort of build their assets, their farms, uh, sometimes little sell settlements, etc. But slowly over time, uh, this sort of archipelago of, of terms uh, wasn't really working, so we started to develop from the 12th century a system of uh, uh, land reclamation, polders as they are called, with a system of dikes and uh, water, which <coughs> fundamentally works like this, I'm sorry for the Dutch, is uh, in, in, in the image. Uh, this, the, on the left you see the Dutch land that is below uh, sea level, and those uh, areas have been slowly reclaimed and they're sort of pumped dry into uh, the word bosom. It's, it's like a canal that uses, that, that works as a sort of conduit for the water. And out of that we pump the uh, uh, water uh, into the sea. And, and the depth of these polders is at maximum about 7 meters, so it's pretty, uh, which is about 20 feet. So it's a pretty substantial depth uh, that's that's uh, we need to uh, deal with, and and that also means there's a substantial amount of water because of course when there's a big storm, all that water needs to be pumped out, or otherwise your uh, water uh, floods. And this image shows on the right the rivers, and and uh, going to Switzerland, basically showing that most of the rivers are actually higher because uh, than the rest of the land because they are connected to the uh, to the sea. So this has created this fantastic Dutch landscape that, that I really learned to admire as I got more interested in landscape architecture and water management where you see all these minute changes and these sort of carefully calibrated uh, systems with originally windmills and, and now uh, a modern uh, pumping station uh, and, and here you see like an archetypical uh, a Dutch image of the higher a canal and the <coughs> cows in the lower area and, and this sort of wetness. And this is here you see an image of, of how, how the Dutch have basically built their own uh, country over time. Um, each uh, 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 little speck is, is one of the polders and the color coding is such that uh, the green are the oldest uh, ones the blue are uh, the second generation, the, the darker blue or the purplish are after that and uh, onto the, onto the uh, orange. And what you see is that over time, man has become better and uh, more and more able in, in uh, uh, reclaiming largest, uh, large areas of land. I mean, simply when you have to work with windmills, um, it's uh, uh, you cannot really get a lot of water out. Uh, windmills are uh, were in the in the 13th, 14th, 15th century relatively expensive feature. So it's some it's a system that was built over time, and it was a system that was really uh, built um, uh, from the bottom up. It was really local people who would uh, join and invest in a dike and uh, build a dike around a piece of land started pumping the water out so that they can start using it for uh, agriculture. And uh, th this is an image of, of the Netherlands uh, around 1300, where basically everything that has now uh, become land uh, is in this image still swamp. It was really uninhabitable. And, and I think this really has formed our, our Dutch uh, culture. Many books have been written about it, one of the most known books about this is the Tractat van Dijk AG. It's a sort of a manual about how to build uh, dikes from, I think, the 16th century. And what is interesting about this manual is that it not only talks about the technical aspects of building dikes, 
but it also talks about the economical and cultural aspects of building dikes. It basically talks about how, how building dikes is a cultural effort and that when you do it well, it will improve your economy. So the sort of notion of to not only think, let's say, one-dimensionally about this, but to think about it as a, as a, as a sort of uh, societal issue is very much ingrained in, you could call it the theory and the manuals of building uh, dikes. And one of the places that becomes uh, very clear, for instance, is in uh, North Holland, which looked like this in the 13th or 14th uh, century, an area of, of, of islands uh, and peninsulas with the occasional city there, but with a lot of wetlands or lakes in between, and that area has been uh, a, a, a sort of reclaimed over time uh, in a, a set of different polders. And if you look at historical maps, you really see this evolution uh, uh, beautifully, and one of the one of the most famous of those polders is a, a polder that they only managed to uh, reclaim in the 17th century, um, the Beemster. And it's an area that, this is just like 10 miles north of Amsterdam. It was at that time a really uh, big lake. And the reclamation of this area was uh, not done by government. <coughs> it was done by a group of investors who sort of teamed together set up a company in order to reclaim the land so that they can use it for agriculture. And this is one of the plants where you really see that, that the uh, structure of this uh, polder was very rational, it was very much uh, thought about in terms of how to maximize the uh, profit out of it. It was almost like a colony of Amsterdam and it became an area that was very important for the sort of food production. And I think that's, that's always interesting because because in the Netherlands we we as in most countries in Europe we come from a country that we really think uh, that that it's top-down government that has been organizing these uh, uh, things but it's really local people it's local communities it's group of investors who have helped to reclaim uh, that lands and, and make Holland uh, dry. And out of these local uh, communities and the organizations that they formed actually came a fourth layer of, of, of government. In the Netherlands we not only have a national government, provincial governments and city governments, but we also have uh, the bodies of the, the, the water uh, 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 management areas and the water catchment areas. That's, that are sort of organized locally and they have elections and you pay taxes for your water management. So this one says on the uh, 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 left, uh, there's one party that focused on, 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 on safe and uh, let's say cheap, and uh, whereas the party on the right, and sorry for the resolution of this image, says we really want to focus on cleaning water, on cleaner water, because of course once you spend time on water management, you understand that keeping pollutants out of the water is equally important. So you see that there's there's even a choice there, like there's no choice to not pump and not manage your water. But there's, there's <coughs> choices and it's part of a political debate about how to do it, what focus to, to do, how to balance, for instance, ec ecology and the needs of uh, agriculture, because that is dependent on the groundwater level. There's also the, the balance between agriculture and the cities, because that also has to do with the, 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 the um, uh, 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 groundwater level. Uh, uh, farmers like their groundwater level high, uh, people in cities like their groundwater level low, because otherwise your basement uh, floods. And these are sort of active uh, political debates in the, in the Netherlands. I think it's really beautiful to have that. And I really also think that this, this culture of um, 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 working as a community on these issues and, and, and being ruled more by the water than you would ever be by kings or princes or whatever has shaped our our culture and our uh, uh, philosophers to be let's say open-minded this is Erasmus and Spinoza to be sort of sort of uh, 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 um, not be dogmatic about anything I, th I think really that's 
that's part of our of our culture. And in, in the, the Netherlands, we 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 have in the last 60, 70 years have changed our perception of how we need to deal with these these waters. Until then, it was really an issue of keeping the water out at all costs. And even after the last big disaster that we uh, had in 1953 in, in uh, uh, the province of Zealand, we had some near misses uh, uh, since, the idea was to uh, protect the estuary of uh, uh, Zealand with a series of waterworks. And you see here that the estuary and, and, and from the north you see that all the arms of the estuary have been uh, closed down from the uh, from the north. But what? But once we started doing that, and that was really a sort of big national project. It uh, for many years cost us about five percent of our uh, gross domestic product to sort of build all these systems to protect ourselves against the water. Uh, this this focus on keeping the water out, we started to understand also had a lot of negative uh, effects. Um, um, uh, people started to be concerned about the ecology of these estuaries. If you would close them off by levees, suddenly the water uh, that used to be a mix of sweet and salt uh, would become uh, sweet water, and of course that brought with it a, a lot of ecological devastation. The flow patterns uh, 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 changed, so over time we started to sort of change our national approach to these things to say, well, maybe our focus should not only be on keeping the water out, but it's, we should also address other issues. We need to start addressing ecological issues. We need to start thinking uh, 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 more holistically about these type of problems. And that's when we started to invest in openable barriers, as you see here on the, uh, 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 on the right. And uh, uh, you see here uh, in Rotterdam, this is the barrier at the end of the Meuse River, uh, which protects the ports of uh, Rotterdam. And that only closes, I think, uh, once every five years, except for test runs. Uh, 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 um, and, and we started to think more about sort of nature-based solutions. This is a, uh, a project called the uh, sound motor, the sand engine, where uh, the hydrological engineers figured out that, it, that rather than building new dune systems and sort of replenishing the sand on the coast uh, at the different locations, they could build uh, a, a large uh, area of sands uh, and then let uh, the streams and the flows of the water do the work of the uh, sediment dispersal over time. And that's a you know, nature-based solution where you really start to work with nature rather than against it. And that's something that we've come to understand better and better because as, as, we, uh, as the sea levels rise, this model becomes more and more difficult. Not only do intense, more intense storm make us have to pump more, so you see that there's a lot of focus now on stormwater flooding and these type of things, but with the sea level ri uh, rising, it's much more difficult for the rivers to discharge their water into the sea. And that means that much more of the country is now again under threat and becoming increasingly under threat of, uh, of flooding. Um, we find that the river channels are too narrow to sort of buffer the water that cannot find an exit at high uh, tides. And we also find that whereas we sort of had a nice uh, country with, let's say, compact cities uh, at, at relatively safe points, uh, we have of course destroyed that over years by rampant suburbanization in these very fragile areas and, and, and suddenly it is very difficult to find the space to sort of buffer the, uh, 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 the water when uh, the, the river are uh, 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 not able to discharge into the, uh, into the sea. So we started a project called Room for the River. And the idea behind Room for the River is that rather than 
channelizing uh, the rivers rather than focusing on maximum flow. We need to create extra space for the rivers to buffer water and to discharge uh, the water. And this is one uh, uh, such, such project. On the left, and you see in the top, uh, 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 the polder uh, south of Rotterdam as it, as it used to be. It uh, used to be uh, a, a, a fully agricultural area. And what we have, uh, are now engineering is uh, the possibility for the water of this, uh, 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 of this river to sort of go through the polder and sort of exit uh, uh, on, the, on the southern side. And the way to do that is by, on the one hand, removing uh, uh, some of the farms for the places that we don't want them and sort of bringing them together at higher uh, uh, locations. So part of it is retreats and only keeping the necessary buildings there at elevated uh, locations. And for instance, changing that, that dike there into a, a sort of bridge so that when high water uh, comes and, and the river is at maximum capacity, it can just sort of flow through this uh, system. And we do that in our agricultural areas, but we also started to do that in our urban areas by uh, necessity. This is another example in the city of Nijmegen, where uh, you have uh, also a tributary of the Rhein, the Waal River, which until recently only made the uh, southern uh, bend, but uh, uh, which was relatively narrow at, at the location of the city that you see on the, on the left at the bridgehead of uh, the, the rail bridge there. And they uh, have decided to make an extra channel on the northern part of the uh, river. Basically, removing everything that was in that channel, creating extra space for uh, the river to, uh, to flow when uh, that would be uh, uh, necessary. So this is how that, how that looks. Uh, they, they call it nice words, like a bay and they then try to give it some sort of recreational um, um, uh, function and, and they say, well, that makes it possible to have this village on the north of Nijmegen to actually have a real waterfront so we can start to make that more attractive, densify it there, uh, get rid of some of the sprawl and, and really make it interesting, uh, 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 make it an interesting place and then also, uh, these are one of the uh, bridges that is going to be made there, sort of play around uh, uh, with the infrastructure, the accessibility of these recreational uh, assets. And the wonderful thing about this bridge is the reason it has a sort of higher point and a lower point is that during high water, uh, twice a year, this path is uh, uh, not accessible because the lower parts will be flooded as a sort of reminder of of, of living with water and of how important this culture of living with water is because people need to understand their water. People need to sort of see in a way, in, and I think that's a task for designers, they need to sort of see um, uh, the, 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 the importance or the impacts that water can, uh, uh, can have. So, so this is the culture that I came uh, uh, from and, and in a way it's a culture that is best summarized by Hans Brinker, the, 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 uh, the boy who, according to an American book that was written 150 <laughs> years ago, stuck his finger in the dike to protect the Netherlands from, uh, uh, from flooding. And it is really, sort of, it's that culture and, and, and that sort of understanding the role that, that, that uh, water can play in our cities and in our environments that that, that, that made it for me interesting to, to, to come here after Sandy and to see if I can be part of the conversation here. But when I'm here, or when I came here, what was very interesting to me is that I discovered that I was in a completely different culture. And it was a culture that is called resilience. And, and, and still in the Netherlands, the fundamental idea about how to deal with water is you sort of protect yourself against it, you nuance it, you look at it holistically, but really what you want uh, to do is um, uh, protect yourself against it. And the notion of resiliency in the United States, which doesn't have this culture of protecting, like 
uh, in the Netherlands we protect our urban areas to one to 14,000 year flood events. In uh, the United States you protect, if you protect, you get insurance if you're in a flood zone which is to one to 100 year flood events. Uh, those numbers really are meaningless because we know that climate change is uh, going so quickly that, that the historical data on which we built those numbers are, are basically a lie to, our, to ourselves. But, but, so, so, but in, the, in the United States they don't have this culture of protecting, so but they have a culture of building resilience, basically finding a way to sort of bounce back from, from shocks and stress that could happen, often related to uh, flooding. Um, but also then thinking about how, how can you use that, and I thought that was really an eye-opener to, um, to not, only strengthen your, not only work on the ability to bounce back from shocks and stresses, but think about adaptation, but also think how can you use these processes to make our cities better. Not only to prepare for whatever shocks and stresses might come, but also as an opportunity for improving our cities. And that's something that I really, really like. So that brings us to, to Sandy. And Sandy, on the one hand, from my original perspective in the Netherlands, when you think about $60 billion in uh, damages, uh, 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 an economy brought to a halt, uh, 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 many uh, 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 casualties, um, you think about it relatively abstractly, but one of the things that I realized when landing here, how incredibly personal these type of events can be. And that, that, that even though I can think about this stuff and I can have a conversation about sort of cultural issues and, and, and things like that, it is, this is really one of the things that you learn as soon as you enter an area that has just been devastated by it, but how incredibly personal it is. And the other thing that you, that you come to an understanding is uh, that, that part of, of uh, uh, the thing that needs to be repaired, uh, part of the, the, the issues focus on all kinds of physical issues, but there's also a very strong social dimension uh, to it. And one of the examples you have in, in uh, in New York, after Sandy and Eric Kleinenberg uh, wrote a fantastic article about that in the New Yorker, is that it's really the social resilience, the strength of communities to deal with the shocks and stresses that makes the difference about how how well and how quickly you bounce back. And this is an example in New York when people were sort of plugging uh, into uh, all their cell phones into the one generator that was in the neighborhood and sort of starting to organize each other uh, to be able to sort of uh, 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 communicate and get back on track, starting to organize themselves. And that's really, so the physical and the social are incredibly uh, interlinked and that's really something that you need to understand. A sort of third component is, um, this is a, um, a, a sculpture in Berlin uh, uh, which has the nickname Politicians Discussing Climate Change. <laughs> that, that, that on the one hand you have to deal with stuff that is really immediate. We hate you Sandy. We need to bounce back as quickly as possible. But there's a whole set of much bigger issues because we cannot continue to adapt if we don't mitigate as, as well. And this is a sort of fantastic uh, drawing that was once uh, made within the same competition that I uh, participated in by uh, SCAPE, Landscape Architecture, which is a fantastic New York office. And they sort of said, well, we're only at the beginning of, of this uh, uh, stuff. Uh, temperatures will rise. We don't know how much exactly. But it's not looking well. Like every time we we think we have an agreement about a certain maximum rise, we see that um, it, those are very difficult to keep political events uh, uh, go against them. But it's also this collective action that is needed is just very very difficult. Uh, sea level uh, rise is going faster than we expected five or ten years ago. Uh, we we now come to understand 
how quickly uh, the ice caps can potentially disintegrate. We start to understand better how uh, higher temperatures basically expand the volume of water, creating sea level rise. And whereas we thought maybe 10 years ago that on the East Coast, which is one of the hot spots of uh, 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 sea level rise, and that's a little bit with uh, global currents in the in, in the sea level body you'll be dead. You whereas we were expecting maybe three feet by the end of the century, we are now sort of saying, well, in the 90th percentile, we could be talking about as much as six or eight uh, feet. But but since we 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 understand the speed with which ice caps can disintegrate, it could be even quicker. We could be in for a shock, and we have to realize that that we have already put a lot of carbon in the air, we are already increasing the temperature before Earth cools down. It will take a very long time. So we're not only talking, let's say, six feet in 2100, we're also talking 20, 50 feet a couple of centuries from now. So it's, it's, it's a serious issue. And then combined with increased urban uh, population and increased storms, I mean, all this excess heat, so it translates itself into increased storms, means that, that, that um, we're in for a rough ride. Um, that, that context uh, 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 um, was uh, what brought us to uh, the United States, where, where I built a team with a Danish firm, uh, a Bjarke Ingels Group, Danish are social, I know about water, and then a whole host of uh, 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 local companies to take part in this competition, which ended up in this proposal that we call the Big U. The Big U um, is a flood protection system for uh, Lower Manhattan. And um, as you know, uh, this is the fantastic New Yorker uh, uh, cover that came out just after uh, Sandy. Lower Manhattan was <coughs> impacted heavily by Superstorm Sandy. And one of the things was that the power plants uh, went out, so that meant that much of uh, downtown uh, did not have electricity for uh, 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 quite some time. And, and, and once you start to understand the damages, you see you can understand damages to infrastructure, uh, streets were uh, <coughs> flooded, um, uh, but, but that also translates itself into a lot of, let's say, personal loss. Not only uh, uh, there, there are a number of, of people who died, but you can sort of imagine in a city there would be this building where there would be this, this elderly lady living on the 20th floor uh, who cannot move well, who doesn't know really their neighbors because cities are very abstract places and, and can then sort of be trapped in her apartment for a couple of weeks uh, without foods. And, and so there's a lot of personal sort of stories like, like that. You really understand their that it's not only a water event, but there's, there's a whole set of related events that, that, that impact people during such a storm and that specifically impacts a vulnerable uh, uh, population. And that's, that's one of the things that this competition helped us understand. It also helped us understand why Sandy created such incredible damage. Uh, it has to do with the fact that much of New York City is at risk of uh, flooding. Uh, uh, in in, in uh, darker blue, the 100 year floodplains um, in the New York uh, metropolitan area, and in the lighter blue, the areas that will be uh, under flood risk uh, by the end of the century, which is mostly, mostly like almost 50% of the, of the city. And, and, and the impact of that is incredible. And it sort of gave rise to a sort of new um, naming in, in New York, like. The area below 14th Street was called SOPO. I mean, in New York, they like to give new names, also <laughs> for real estate reasons. But this was the area below 14th Street, south of Power. And, and the reason much of that was south of Power is in, in effect because of the Dutch, who started a, a land reclamation that has continued for centuries uh, to build uh, new developments, to build port facilities, uh, and to later on built new housing, uh, infrastructure, etc. So here you see the tip of Manhattan and you see how it has grown over time. And it's because of that that much of uh, uh, Manhattan uh, is in the FEMA flood zone. The northern part of this uh, drawing is 
West uh, 57th Street, uh, and uh, on the uh, east side, uh, East 42nd Street. And you see that sizable areas are in the flood zone. And of course, after Sandy, then uh, New York City made proposals of how to deal with future flooding. And those proposals had a lot of uh, almost acupunctural things, strengthen these power plants, make sure that the water doesn't flood into the subway entrance, uh, fortify uh, this critical facility, make sure that you can access this hospital. But basically for <coughs> Lower Manhattan, it said uh, what you really need there because the floodplain is so deep and there's so much at stake, both in population, economy, and real estate, that you would really like to have an integrated flood protection system that would protect this entire uh, area. And that would be about eight to 10 miles, uh, depending on how you count of, uh, of, let's say, resiliency infrastructure. And the question then, by the time we started working on, on, on this competition, was like, how do you do that? And how do you do that when, when the city has, after the port facilities have sort of left uh, in the last decades, uh, that has in a city that has sort of reconnected to the waterfront, how do you build a flood protection system there? Do you build like a wall, which needs to be about 12 feet uh, high, basically disconnecting the river again from its uh, 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 river? Or do you build something temporary? Uh, 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 Maybe that's possible, but it would take about 100,000 new civil servants to sort of install such a temporary system every time um, a flood threatens, and not only when the flood would come. So that would be maybe a couple of times a year to sort of put this up and, 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 and take this down with all the fragility and risk for, uh, uh, that, that comes with it. It's not for nothing that the German Chancellor Angela Merkel looks like she's in such a bad mood uh, <laughs> uh, here. Uh, so it's, it, it's like very complex. And what we did is we took our cue from the High Line, which is um, and, uh, and one of the first things you in some ways see as a tourist or you get uh, led to as a tourist in uh, the United States, where uh, they basically used um, a, 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 a railway line that was not used anymore, that was taken out of commission, and they built a linear park on it. And so that's fantastic. That's what we want. We, we, we think it's brilliant to combine infrastructure with program. And why would you wait? Can it not be that once you start building your resiliency infrastructure, you can at the same time, not wait until it's decommissioned, you at the same time start building it to something that is, that is there for the people and that, that has different types of programs attached uh, 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 to it. And, to us, that was interesting because it linked to another issue that we have, this sort of abstract idea of 10 miles of wall or whatever it is, uh, this sort of big project felt like it would not connect to the different neighborhoods that were there, which of course are all very different. You have a whole set of different conditions. Uh, so, so we said, well, maybe it should also be thought of as something that is much more diverse. And maybe it should also not be thought of as one project, but as multiple projects, because it's really difficult to build an infrastructure project of eight miles of, of uh, coastal infrastructure at once. Uh, the city might not have the capacity to finance that or to manage that or these types of things. Why not we start using the way the floodplain is organized with sort of areas where it's less deep, where you go to a higher elevation, very close to the uh, flood line, to, to basically connect back uplands at those points so that it's not one big thing, but that's a series of smaller things, almost like a ship, uh, where uh, uh, you have the different compartments in a hull where uh, uh, ideally when one of the elements, uh, one of the compartments would break, the ship would still stay afloat. So for these reasons, linking it to the community, linking it to program, thinking about how do you manage such a big project, how do you deal with that um, in terms of, of, of the fragility of one uh, project. We, we made what we call the big U, a set of smaller U's. We said this should not be one big project, this should be really a sort of community-driven uh, infrastructure. And, and our 
sort of way of, of describing that was to say what we want to bring together is the sort of big thinking of this guy to the left, which is Robert Moses, the guy of the parkways, of the, of the big beaches, the big parks, the, the big moves in uh, 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 New York, uh, together with uh, the thinking of uh, Jane Jacobs, the woman to the, to the right who thought about communities and the vitality of communities in creating the city. So we, what we want to do basically is see if we can design the love baby of these two people. <laughs> They, that was, would be very difficult uh, because they were really antagonistic uh, <laughs> uh, during real life. So he said, well, maybe, maybe we should start to think of a city of neighborhoods as a city of, of, of resilient community districts, and we should start thinking of the uh, 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 flood protection uh, 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 system uh, uh, not so much as a wall, but sort of as, as, a, as a series of things that could be something completely different and that could have all kinds of programs and all kinds of different functions uh, which would have to be a sort of benefit to the local communities at the uh, days and it's most of the days that there is no flood threat. So these were sort of our initial sketches about that idea. Um, with that idea, we got into the second round, which was cool. But then we needed to start thinking about, okay, how do we do that now? And how do we, how do, we do that? And then we, we, we figured out, closing that what we needed to do is not so much uh, make a design. I mean, we're all good at making designs, but what we need to do is to develop a process with the community and with the different agencies, with all these different stakeholders that, so that together we could start developing this uh, uh, design. So we started to understand a bit better all the different political uh, uh, constituencies, all the different uh, community groups. We started to understand what was public land, what was uh, uh, private uh, land, and really organized an incredible amount of, of, of interactions with all the different stakeholders in this process that would help us get this uh, uh, design and 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 and, and that that's in this competition we focus on that on the on the Lower East Side, which is in a strange way this this typical Robert Moses uh, 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 landscape of public housing uh, sort of disconnected from the waterfront by a lot of uh, uh, infrastructure and a bit to the north of that, uh, uh, this uh, uh, a park that is not really used by the local uh, neighborhood because they cannot really cross the uh, FDR drive that is there. And it's, a, it's an area that was really hit very hard by Sandy, but it's also an area that is, um, uh, has a lot of very vulnerable people uh, in it. So with uh, uh, that we started to sort of develop a whole set of uh, design solutions. So this is the same area a bit more to the north, but again public housing, the FDR drive and the, and, and the park. And we said, well maybe what we can do is we can build in the uh, uh, service road of the park, we can build a levee, uh, a sort of dike, and, and we can use that maybe to shield the park from the highway, that would be great because now it's really noisy. But, but also, when you go a bit higher, then suddenly you can start to connect easily, much more easily, uh, across the FDR uh, uh, drive to the to the neighborhood. And maybe you can design it such. We thought that uh, you could, in 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 the long term, even start thinking about covering the FDR because there's no reason that you should have urban highways in. Uh, uh, in American uh, city. So we, we, we basically <coughs> came up with a whole set of, of possible solutions. When the FDR was elevated, we said, well, maybe it would be possible to, to have flipped down uh, deployables underneath, which could keep uh, the water out. But once you start doing that, why not think of them as a public art project, not create good lighting on it, so that this area, which is a bit spooky at night, uh, can actually become a, a nice promenade at night, which you can sort of close uh, uh, um, uh, when, when the water comes. Or maybe in another part, a bit more to the south, you can integrate your flood protection, you saw that in the video, 
with sort of uh, market halls or things like that. So you can uh, create a farmer's market uh, 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 there. Of course, you would like uh, and some of the streets there be to be the relationship with the, the uh, water. So in between these pavilions, uh, you could uh, start to think of uh, movable uh, doors. And you can even start to start thinking about how to integrate uh, all this um, um, into, into buildings. For instance, at the sudden tip of the battery, where there's an ugly Coast Guard building, you can start to think about integrating it into a new school that was really sort of necessary there and have a great venue and maybe uh, even there build a sort of what we call a reverse aquarium where uh, you could actually see uh, sea level rise developing over uh, time. So that's, that's over uh, uh, to, to really sort of create uh, a sort of strong uh, uh, sort of new idea for, for, for Lower Manhattan. And, and that we really worked on together with, with this umbrella organization of community organizations called uh, Ellie is Lower East Side Ready, not less ready. Uh, and, and, and where we basically said, let's make a joint uh, a planning uh, a team and let's not in our events sort of come with a design solution, but basically just show um, um, what could be possible <coughs> approaches to dealing with flood protection. You can start to say, and then of course that's something that designers can do really well. We make models of all kinds of typical solutions, sometimes <coughs> more integrated, sometimes in a bench, sometimes these sort of pavilions uh, at other moments integrated in the buildings and have conversations about this with the different people in the local community and have a whole set of, of events where uh, together we, we uh, basically develop uh, the plan. And that was really something that, that, that we thought worked incredibly well because it really made it possible to make this big, big you a sort of tailored uh, approach and also it made it possible to not only think about the cost of protection but to link that to the communities, to stormwater, to jobs, to uh, how to get rid of the impervious services uh, 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 there, etc. So the whole project had like an incredible sort of toolbox of, of, of potentials in addition to um, um, of what, what we uh, design as the sort of coastal uh, uh, protection because you again that's one of the things that I learned in, in, in Holland but that's what we started to learn more and more in the United States you need to look at these at these uh, 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 problems but also at its opportunities as, as holistically as uh, possible um, that brings me to Portsmouth and I'm not going to say too much because I'm not an expert you all know much more, and, and, and when I understand, there's uh, even uh, 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 there's some studies that have been done into the into the situation here. Um, but I but I I want to for the people who haven't looked at flood maps recently, at least want to sort of show them, and and in the hope that maybe some of the things that I've been showing uh, uh, can can sort of resonate, even though I know it's in a very different uh, 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 this is uh, uh, your city and uh, of course we are starting to see and we've had it earlier uh, this week as well uh, slowly the impact of sea level rise is becoming manifest in our cities we slowly see bulkheads overflowing we slowly start to imagine how certain roads that we use on a daily basis might not be so usable in the in the near uh, future. We see that in, in New York, in Boston, in uh, uh, and and in, in, in Portsmouth. And 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 what you see here is that that in the near term, apart from occasional high tide, which on a uh, often goes together with a beautiful moon, so you're more focused on the beauty of the moon than on the high tides. <laughs> um, uh, for the, in, the, in, the, in the coming decades, with, with modest sea level rise, um, uh, things are not, are not really uh, bad. You see, there's a couple of areas that, that, that you can start to imagine that if a sandy type storm had 
it would would start to uh, 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 really uh, 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 flood. You of course have the inlands. You of course have the area behind Prescott uh, Park. But it, initially, it is not uh, so bad. But once you start to think about the long term, mm -hmm. you start uh, to see, and we here drew the contours of seven and a half feet and and eighteen feet. You start to see that that significant uh, areas might be under. Uh, under threat. And um, Cameron uh, 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 gave a talk here last year and uh, gave you uh, uh, some, some advice on how to uh, uh, deal with it, but, but I think we're not there uh, yet, but it's something that you need to start uh, 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 considering. For instance, once you start to work on Prescott Park, which is a really a great opportunity uh, to, to build some coastal resiliency. You have to make sure that when you plant <coughs> such a park, that it is uh, 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 that it can deal with with uh, salty uh, water. But you can also start to think how can we uh, design it such that it starts to protect uh, uh, the areas behind it. You need to at South then need to start thinking about uh, uh, this high gate that is there. Does that need to be upgraded? Uh, but you also want to start thinking about your uh, land use decisions in a different way. You need to start thinking about, like in the Netherlands, either maybe we shouldn't build too much stuff in the floodplain, but start to work a bit more upland because it also has other benefits. It creates density, which is for a nice small city like, like Portsmouth, which is wonderful because <coughs> the fact that it's still relatively compact is really an asset. Uh, uh, and you can start thinking about a whole lot of other things because this is an image that we that that, that we uh, took from from our Manhattan uh, uh, work is uh, where it sounds nice and maybe even like it's probably where it sounds nice to sort of build a levee in disguise around Manhattan. That's only part of what you need to do, because you need to start managing your stormwater. You need to start uh, uh, dealing with the fact that there's salt water intrusion that will start uh, impacting your uh, utilities. There's a whole set of, of issues that you need to start thinking about over time. And, and I am sometimes, like, like, I think that it's only after Superstorm Sandy that this, this issue became firmly on the map of, of, uh, in the United States. Like Katrina was an outlier, but Sandy, what happened this summer in, in, in uh, uh, the Caribbean, Caribbean was really sort of proof that, that this is a sort of more common thing. We need to start thinking about it. We also start to understand as we are working towards solutions how complex these issues are. I, like, I am much less naive than I was two or three uh, years ago simply from the understanding of how all these things uh, work together. But what I, what I, uh, uh, I don't want to talk too much more about um, um, Portsmouth, but what I do want to do is I brought some projects from Boston that, that we are working on that show approaches which are in a way a bit different than, than the New York approach. In um, as, uh, East Boston, we discovered that during an, uh, 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 at this moment, during the 1% annual flood, much of the water uh, sort of enters uh, East Boston here through this railway that is uh, uh, that is here, and once that happens, this entire area starts to get inundated. So, so one of the things that we propose there, and, and, and I think Boston will start building it, is to make sure that at this moment you plug those gaps. You don't have to spend hundreds of millions. You need to plug those gaps that are urgent now. And at the same time, what you need to start doing is really thinking about how can we, in our coastal zone, start to create space for what we're going to have to do eventually. So no more development there, because at some moment, maybe in 2017, <coughs> we're going to need a big U there. So we need to start preserving the space, we need to start changing our land use, we need to start 
changing uh, to a certain extent our building codes, and maybe maybe we can we can through that not only sort of plug this uh, a gap, but really start to organize a sort of strategy at the lower, larger scale where we say uh, 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 slowly prepare ourselves for the inevitability of flood protection that we're going to have to build 50 years down the road. And maybe if we do that now, we can start to make it nice. Because nice is always good. Nice is, is, is it's a good way to uh, 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 create in this process assets for the community. Uh, uh, it, it's also a way to make sure that you can uh, start generating revenue that you might need in the in the long run. So really what we are trying to do in, in, in Boston is very much a layered strategy where we say there are particular things that need to happen now and for the rest we need to prepare for what needs to happen much uh, And of course also that process as much as this process in, in, in Lower Manhattan is only as good as the as you can, you're able to in, involve the community because local people know best. They can tell you how to, you can sort of come up as a professional with, with um, uh, sort of initial ideas, but they can only materialize, they can only become better through community involvement. They can also only become these sort of complex ideas where you stack benefits on top of each other by involving the local communities. And I think it's a responsibility for us as designers to demand uh, the community involved, the community to, to demand to involve the community and to really develop a set of tools and design approaches that can involve the community. But it's also your responsibility to be part of these processes, to be vocal about it, to, to sort of start thinking this is an issue that, that, can, that allows us to really not only deal with these threats, but also create a better city, but we can only do it when we do it uh, together. Um, on the more positive note, I just want to show you some images of where we are now with the uh, design of the first section of the big hill. We're working on uh, two different sections. The, the first one is the east side coastal resiliency. We'd like to start construction about a year, year and a half from uh, now. Uh, we're also working on the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency. I kind of show you that work. But at, at the East Side Coastal Resiliency, we, we discovered that this park that is there, that is underutilized, is really something that we can connect to the community, that we can use uh, in, in a different way to create more community space, more passive uh, uh, space and really add a new fantastic park to the city. So this is what it looks now. This is uh, uh, with a sort of new bridge and a better uh, uh, connection. And here you see this uh, landscape and this is what it uh, will look like when it's, when it's flooded. Here uh, you see these bridges at this moment are really these sort of prison uh, 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 bridges and minimally dimensioned, strictly utilitarian. So we're really working on making sort of better connections, creating uh, in, uh, uh, nice spaces in these parks, making it much less uh, anonymous and using the different terrains to uh, uh, create different types of spaces, different types of um, uh, experiences that are uh, there. For instance, here where uh, you're at Houston Street, there's a sort of uh, uh, a set of baseball fields and, and a sort of entrance to the park that is a bit higher. And what we are uh, proposing now is to sort of use this new element that we are designing also as a stance for the baseball fields. We need to reconfigure the baseball fields a bit. Uh, use a, have a community space on top, use it as a place for food carts and things like that, for picnics, so that it really becomes uh, a, a, a community uh, space. Um, and here you have some of the ways in which uh, now the uh, sort of entrance to the park is behind this building. You cannot really sort of uh, see it and, and in our vision uh, there will be sort of much nicer entrance from the community uh, into the uh, 
I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Um, we're we're uh, ready for questions now. Peter, is there a um, mobile mic out there? <coughs> so if you uh, have a question for our speaker, just raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in the future, if the sea level rise gets so high, like that it starts over with the storm, starts over topping these structures, will the southern part of New York City become a bathtub? Uh, it, it will already, with these structures, become a bathtub during stormwater events. Yeah. Um, and, and so one of the challenges of this project is also to uh, improve the interior drainage of uh, uh, Manhattan to make sure that, that the stormwater can be sort of retained, doesn't cause uh, uh, CSO overflows, and, and doesn't cause local uh, flooding. But it's true, in the, in the future, like one of, one of the things that is very important to realize is that the big U will help New York for the next 50 to 70 years. It buys time. It buys time to start preparing for other stuff that needs to happen climate change and connected sea level rise is an ongoing process and, uh, and, and we need to start <coughs> preparing for it and we are wholly unprepared and, uh, and so yes if the big U is there you still need to accept that there can be storms that are so big that they <coughs> overflow. Uh, and that means that you still need to make sure that you have the generators on the roof, so you build redundancy in the system. And at the same time, your planning processes need to be such that you continue working on it. That's why we think that this involvement of the community is so important, because I'm not going to be around, but the communities are there, and they need to be invested and in understanding uh, and advocating uh, a climate change adaptation uh, because because they are the ones who need to sort of keep the torch burning. You run into a lot of resistance with people accepting the science of climate change. Have you run into that in New York, and how do you deal with it? In Not in New York. <laughs> no, and, and uh, a big storm is, is a great help in it. <laughs> no, and like. I think you see it in in other places, like like the entire world accepts climate change, except one political party in the United States, <laughs> the only political party in the world, and 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 their constituents. But those people really understand risk, <coughs> and 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 so if you keep your conversations practical, how do we deal with risk? Uh, then uh, you can move forward. Um, you cannot really make long-term plans based on assumptions that are embedded in, uh, in, in climate change. <coughs> but you can uh, develop plans based on uncertainty and the fact that, for instance, uh, 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 you can have a thousand-year storm event like they've had in Houston uh, uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, I need someone to <laughs> make this, <laughs> we could just go in this direction. Ma'am, over there. Yes, the question that I have is it seems like there are two different types of events that we're looking at. One has to do with these quote unquote 100 year storms that are now occurring much more frequently. The other had to do with coastal rise, uh, which as I perceive it, is once that coastal rise occurs, right, that that's permanent, and comes in and out of the tide, but we're going to see an overall rise of, yes. the, of the ocean, which is clearly where we are, as a um, considerable concern. 
So you're, I'm not quite sure I understand when you're putting in all these parks and so forth. I understand the role that they have when you have a, a, a major storm, but how do you deal with the predicted rise of, of the oceans um, in places along the whole yeah. eastern seaboard? Yeah. Yeah. I understand your question. The way we talk about it is we say with climate change come fundamentally four different hazards in the, in the Northeast. Uh, the first one is storm events. Those are unpredictable uh, coastal storm events, that's called different, coastal flood. And, and they will be increased by uh, a higher temperatures, so they'll be more intense. Than the second thing is sea level rise, and that cause, causes recurrent flooding. Tidal flooding, king tides, etc. Uh, the third one is more precipitation, <coughs> bigger storms, um, like we've seen during Harvey. Uh, and, and the fourth one is uh, uh, increased heat stress which causes urban heat islands in, in the city, that's a big issue. And what you, what you see is that these different hazards, they compound each other. Like, if, if a storm brings eight feet of storm, of coastal flooding, uh, that if you combine it with three feet of sea level rise, you have 11 foot storm. And so, um, and, and, and basically you can start thinking about protecting yourselves from these hazards independently or in a combined way. Uh, what the big U does is it will help for a very long time against sea level rise and tidal flooding because it's a pretty high thing. Uh, it will keep the water out. It will not protect you if you don't do work on your drainage for big precipitation events. Um, it it um, will, in the long term, not really protect you against 100-year storm events, because those will come sooner. And then the question they ask themselves in New York is, OK, what does that mean? We are now sort of OK with the big U if we build it for a while. But then, how are you going to adapt in the future? And one of the things you might do is you might say, well, we built a surge barrier between uh, New Jersey and Long Island to keep storm surge out, because then the big U is really a thing that will help you against your daily or yearly floods. <coughs> and so we keep the big events there. Or you can say, no, we try to change the system at this location, if that's possible, and build that, that higher. We, we, our foundations are built such that you can add another three feet of structures in it. So you need to think about, okay, how do we do it? Or are, are, are people saying, well, let's not invest so much in all the assets that we have behind the big U, because we know that eventually we're going to have to leave. Let's start investing more on higher ground. So there are different adaptation strategies, and as you move forward in time, you're going to be able to figure out which ones to take. But this is not one solution. Uh, I would add a fifth uh, threat that may not be an issue so much in New York City, but uh, Hurricane Maria hit about that uh, very much, not so much in this project, but in the Long Manhattan uh, work, we, we see that seepage and, and, uh, of groundwater, uh, of, of salt water, salt water intrusion is a really big issue. And it's, it's an issue on a number of levels. One is that it starts lifting up buildings and subway tunnels, <coughs> etc. 
but also it starts to corrode the utilities that you have mm -hmm. underground. So one of the things that we are now exploring in, in uh, Lower Manhattan is do we need to build an entirely new system for our utilities <coughs> in order to protect against future uh, 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 salt water intrusions? Or do we, can we build, let's say, a seepage wall, which is basically you, you sort of fortify the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the ground under your uh, bulkhead until basically you reach the, uh, the bedrock uh, to make sure that the, there's no water coming in. But th th it's all <coughs> very difficult. And that's what I say when, when I said we're only now realizing, like, like even <coughs> in the city, when we started this process, or even Axel was funded this process, uh, did not really understand the complexity of all these things that, that uh, we're going to come across. Who will be funding the first two projects in New York City? So the, the funding of, of the East Side Coastal Resiliency is started with a federal grant of, of $335 million, which was the result of us winning this competition, and that the city has added about four million dollars of million dollars to that. Um, the second part, the Lower Manhattan, is partly also funded by uh, thank you, uh, partly also funded federally, but uh, only for the area between where we stop with ESCR and the Brooklyn Bridge. That's where the vulnerable populations live. And for Lower Manhattan, we are now, as part of planning study, trying to figure out how to fund it and what are different options. And uh, that's 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 difficult because there's a lot of, sort of politics behind behind that. Like people say, we pay so many taxes. Why do we need to also pay, or can we pay through development? Or these are options that we're all sort of researching. Thank you. Yeah, two quick questions. In regards to aquarium, is there a precedent for that anywhere in the world? And secondly, I think I missed this. When you discussed the birth and resilience in America, what were you contrasting that to that you were used to in the Netherlands? The, um, it, it, um, I don't know about the reverse aquarium, but I think you, you have these, you have, of course, uh, not on this scale and not this prominent uh, position, but you have places in amusement parks or you can sort of watch to the sea or the resorts. So uh, um, I don't I don't worry so much about the sort of technical possibilities. It would be sort of great, almost gadget to have. Um, the, the second question is um, it, 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 it's a bit difficult given the fact that we. Like what I was trying to contrast is that you can have a singular focus on protection, or you can have a sort of more complex focus on protection where it's needed, making sure that people are prepared and that that, that physical infrastructure are prepared so they can bounce back quickly, uh, retreat at places where you don't uh, want it, etc. And these are all under the bracket of resilience. If you don't protect everything like fundamentally we do in the Netherlands in spite of our little corrections in the room with the river you need a more diverse set of tools and that's what, what you see now in, in America and in New York for instance it is very logical to protect lower Manhattan because there's just so much stuff there and so many people there but there are other areas for instance Staten Island where you say well you just retreat or you sort of accept the water coming in and learn to live with the water. And you showed a graph um, with, with everything rising. Yeah. The urban population was going right up pretty steep and then it plateaued and fell off around 2075. Why was it? What, do you know why that drop off happened? Yeah, those are, those are I, I think, uh, UN or whatever projections that. Um, in, in, the, in the next decades, Asia, uh, some countries in Asia will still continue to grow rapidly. Some, um, for instance, India and, 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 and China. In China, you've already had the migration to the cities to a large extent. In India, it's only now 
starting to, to happen. In Africa, you really start to see it uh, uh, happening, but there's a lot of grounds to cover there, and, and people are feeling that demographically, uh, there will be a sort of new balance, uh, both in the urban population in relation to the rural population, as well as there will be a sort of plateau in the global population. That's where my thoughts get. First of all, thank you. Okay. I, I still I'm going from out there, so I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, is, is Miami got the shovel in the ground yet? <laughs> well, Miami is doing a number of things. They they're having a, a number of extra pumps. They are elevating in Miami Beach uh, some some roads, which is really interesting. You see that, that the road is higher than the ground floor in some uh, uh, some buildings. Um, <coughs> I, I haven't really dug deep into the situation of uh, Miami. Um, I also understand that in the long term, um, and those might be relatively near, but in the long term, it's going to be very difficult to preserve not only uh, Miami, but also many of the coastal communities in Florida. And then the question becomes, like, once people start realizing that, the downturn can go much quicker because people will not continue to invest in, in, in the area. They're in trouble. And, and um, yeah, they're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but also because, because, the, because of the limestone, you cannot do what the, 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 the Dutch are basically 20 feet below sea level, but we have clay and sands, which are pretty impenetrable. Uh, so we can build our levees and use our dune systems and then just pump everything out. But if you have porous stone, mm -hmm. uh, you cannot do that. Yeah. Or you need really big pumps. Yeah. <laughs> can you put some dollar signs around these projects before they have trouble when you cut taxes? You Where do you find the money to, to, to build the power? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a, a very difficult issue. In general, um, research has shown that for every dollar that you spend in prevention, you'll save four to five dollars in the long run. So the economic case can be made. The question, of course, is where does the money come from? And, and one of the things that we see, and that's, that's a societal challenge, I think, is that, for instance, in Houston, um, Houston lived on the cheap. They had low taxes, they didn't preserve land, so they, they, they were able to grow an economy by basically increasing the amount of risk for flood events. <laughs> and, then, and then the question becomes, who needs to pay for that? Do, do you, I mean, you're going to be asking maybe the federal government, because you're here in Portsmouth, but do the people in Burlington <coughs> need to pay for the people in Houston who have basically, by not paying taxes, uh, lived on the cheap? How far does this socialization go? And it's a really difficult, difficult issue, I find. I don't know the answer to it, but these questions are going to come because uh, I think... Um, emergency uh, management cost, let's say FEMA and disaster recovery, is slowly becoming one of the biggest uh, 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 parts of the federal budget. We don't know it yet because we hide it and we don't vote on it and it's dispersed everywhere, etc. But disaster recovery is, is, is going to soon be almost as expensive as, let's say, defense. Um, you showed us a picture of the sand engine over in the Netherlands. Yep. Do you see opportunities for that kind of innovative nature-based design in America and sort of how to get people to buy on without the proven tested methods? Yeah, so I, I, people are exploring these type of things in uh, Louisiana. Um, 
uh, which, which is logical because reverse processes have really uh, sort of killed the coastline there. I think they, about a football field gets lost every minute or something mm -hmm. uh, like that. And they're trying to find these nature-based uh, solutions. Um, I had a conversation yesterday uh, with, about the walkaways, uh, where we are working on the western tip of the walkaways, which is an area called Breezy, Breezy Point and the Gateway National Park, etc. And that gets a lot of sand from the uh, areas that get replenished uh, uh, relatively frequently more to the east of the walkaways. But the city is trying to sort of reconsider whether they can continue this center punch because it's really expensive. And so then you start to think, can we have more uh, natural systems in, in doing that? And that's, I think, why the sand engine is such an exciting project, because it allows us to do the necessary research uh, to see if this can actually uh, work. Uh, I think it should be able uh, 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 to work. I'm happy that we're going to be experimenting with it in Louisiana. Um, uh, the difficulty with, with many of the nature-based solutions is that there's still a mindset of wanting risk to re be reduced measurably. And nature-based solutions are much more difficult to measure. And so that's, that's one of the things that you'll always uh, find. Right. What is your message to the people that continue to rebuild homes on areas such as the Jersey Shore that oh, we're <laughs> uh, And that us, yeah. we are the government, we are the ones paying for people to yeah. continue to I, build. I find it, I found it really uh, disappointing that a couple of months ago, the National Flood, Flood Insurance Program, which is a faulty program, which creates uh, all kinds of, uh, let's say, adverse effects, Mm -hmm. uh, because it basically allows you to pay less in flood insurance than, than a real risk assessment would make you pay, uh, that it was uh, renewed so easily. Uh, also, not only because of this monetary thing, but because it allows for repeat uh, losses, uh, it is not strict about Staying the hell out of these uh, uh, places or not rebuilding, so there's 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 uh, that's really a, a, a missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. Regarding the um, nature-based uh, program that this lady talked about here, we got the sands. Um, are you aware of what happened about a year and a half ago down in Plum Island, where they have been losing a significant amount of uh, <coughs> sand over the years, and there were a bunch of houses that actually got swallowed up by the ocean. Yeah. Um, and why that wasn't tried there? A lot of people just brought in sand by the, the municipality brought in sand um, buckets of it and, and bulldozers for yeah. it. And they just added sand, but that obviously didn't fix the problem. Yeah, I was, I'm not aware of that, but I've, I've heard of similar things. Uh, nature is pretty strong. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really strong thing. Don't fight it. Um, work with it. What uh, organization or governmental entity took the lead on the big view? Um, the uh, mayor's office of recovery and resiliency, or is the is the, the is in terms of the policy component of it and the integration component of it, the lead agency. And in terms of the implementing agencies, the Department of Design and Construction, DDC. And then Parks, Department of Parks and Department of uh, Transportation have a, have a big role in the, in the project. We are now starting to see a newer project that we're working on, the Department of Environmental Protection, which does the drainage and the sewage system, it starts to get a bigger role, but that's sort of part of a new insight that I just talked about. You say you start to understand how all these things are, are, are related. Yeah. So first of all, thank you for a wonderful talk. And I, I loved your picture of uh, 
from the Netherlands of the bridge that actually floods twice a year as a reminder. Uh -huh. um, uh, my question on, on the Big U project is, I, I assume that you're beginning to do budget estimates, and I'm just wondering what the relative cost of the actual protective infrastructure versus the storm water to get rid of the water that comes in. Is it is it one to one? Is it ten to one? Is like is there a big investment in the storm water compared to the, the barriers? Or is it I, I don't know the details, so don't quote me on this, but I think there's a about a third of the cost is storm water. But don't quote me on that. But a, a big, a big <coughs> chunk a, of it. It's a, nice, it's, it's a couple of hundred million dollars, yeah. Plus, two plus questions. We have a lot of um, photos in there showing a lot of public input. As um, as an architect and designer, how much how much do you allow the public input to play into your final design? I, I try to do it as much as possible. Um, and but there's there's a um, it's a process that you need to think about very carefully um, because at different phases of a design there are different things that you can talk about and you need to be very clear up front when you can talk about what things and when you can talk about other things that's, that's one element that is very important a sort of second uh, um, thing that is, that is very important is that um, I think as a designer you bring a number of things to the table. One is the ability to sort of um, show the types of solutions that you can think about, only to have them sort of be improved uh, once you start to think of them uh, uh, locally. Um, as a designer, you also have the ability, and you need to give yourself that time to sort of integrate all kinds of, of maybe possible contrarian opinions about something into a design. So it's not it's not that the public designs you design and you bring it back, and you 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 you, you let them in some ways co-design, but you need to. Give yourself that 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 space, and you need to be very uh, articulate about that. That you need that space, and you play a big role in communicating, and and through that, in a way, and it's a responsibility I think that you have as a designer, uh, editing the conversations, because there's there a massive amount of information that can be taken into account, and 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 if if you sort of dump all that information on a community meeting or on a community, you will never get anywhere. You can also then sort of plead professionalism, which is not good. You have to be honest in, in keeping, in a way, the conversation transparent, yet simple, so that you can really focus on, on the things that, that you need to focus on. But what you try to do with a low research community is say, we need to start with a conversation about risk reduction, urban benefits, and uh, feasibility. And we cannot think of these things, we cannot sort of not have all these things, three things at the table and, and work with you, because we know what you're going to choose if we only talk about urban benefits. And so that, that was very important. Last question. You had a, you had a question? I did. You know, yeah. Yeah. You, uh, uh, as part of your talk, you mentioned that one of the uh, considerations for communities is that they may very well have to redo their uh, uh, conduit systems, their uh, the utilities, and so on. Could you speak a bit about what, how you would be thinking about uh, potable water and drinking yeah. water and where? Yeah. Where does that kind of thing yeah, that's a, in that's the scheme? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, because there's, um, we've talked about, let's say, nature-based solutions for uh, coastal protection, but I think also there there's a sort of great um, uh, opportunity for, for uh, nature-based solutions. And, and with that, public realm improvements, etc. Uh, in New York, uh, stormwater 
black water and gray water gets mixed into a combined sewer system. Um, the problem with that system is uh, that during big rain events, the, there's so much water in the system that the treatment plant cannot take all the water. So there are sewage overflows and they dump it into the East River or into the uh, Hudson River or into the water systems and it creates a lot of pollution. So, so one of the first things to work towards, I think from the perspective <coughs> of clean water, is to see if you can separate these systems. There's another reason why you separate these systems, because um, with sea level rise, these overflows that are now above the water will be underwater. So that means that they, they will back up and start to create local flooding. But it means that there's a sort of second thing that you want to do if you want to find possibilities to create to retain as much of the stormwater in the urban area in a in a in a uh, for instance by creating water squares or local wetlands or uh, having water on, on, on roofs keeping it over blue roofs and things like it so that's that's, that's a very simple thing. Separate the systems, retain the stormwater locally, but then also for the black water and the gray water, you can start to think how can we use nature-based systems or what can we do with the water? Because part of that is water, and part of that is nutrients, or energy, or things like that. So in the Netherlands, what, what we are working on is a uh, uh, project which we call like a biorefinery, where we recycle the, the black water and, and, and basically it's an experiment of city so you do different things with it. You use it to make energy, get nutrients out, use the nutrients as fertilizers for a park, using then the water which is not as <coughs> which is relatively clean and sort of stream it through a nature area so that it sort of uh, cleans itself before it, it goes into the canal. So there's a lot of opportunities with with, with water and you really need to think about this as, again, it's, it's a bit of fashion work as holistically as possible because uh, all these things are interlinked and, and also offer great opportunities once you start linking these systems and think in a much more circular way. To so think, think of your resource streams as something that you sort of want to bring back into the system rather than just sort of pumping it out and letting others do it. Thank you very much.